Um, so it is a great pleasure to have our former colleague, Dr. Juan Calderon Bustillo today for our virtual Astro Seminar. Uh, so most of you know Juan, but let me first say a few words uh, to, um, about him for those of you who do not know him. Uh, so Juan did his PhD at the University of the Balearic Islands, uh, Spain, he then moved for a postdoc at Georgia Tech in the US. Uh, he then came here to Monash, where a good fraction of us had the pleasure to meet him. Um, and he moved earlier this year for an adjunct assistant professor uh, position at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he's now back to his alma mater at the University of Santiago de Compostela, uh, where he's taking a position at, um, as a La Caixa junior leader and a Marie Curie fellow. Uh, so Juan will be presenting his two latest papers on the famous uh, GW190521 uh, gravitational wave source and so I'd like to say muchas gracias to Juan for accepting our invitation and agreeing on staying awake uh, so late um, to enlighten us all about uh, your recent uh, results. So gracias and take it away, Juan. Okay, thank you. I, I should say Darian for uh, your gracias. No worries. Um, so yeah, it's a great pleasure to, to see you all again, even if only virtually. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, to go back to Melbourne at some point. Uh, so but let's get to the talk. Uh, so I'm gonna share screen and let's see if I can find the presentation. Okay, so this is it. Um, so as uh, most of you may know, uh, the LIGO and Virgo collaborations uh, where I have the, the pleasure to work, uh, presented uh, two months ago, the event GW190521, which was a very particular event among all of those that uh, the detectors Advanced LIGO and Virgo have detected uh, so far. So I'm gonna discuss, uh, discuss the properties of, of the source of this signal in a few contexts. So I'm gonna describe the, the standard analysis that the LIGO collaboration did, assuming this is the typical merger of, of two black holes. Then I'm gonna discuss uh, three possible scenarios that have been given that are alternative to this one in particular. Two of them consider that this could be an eccentric merger of uh, black holes. And uh, then I'll go for a, a description that we gave uh, a few weeks ago, proposing that this may actually not be the collision of two black holes, but that of uh, more exotic stars called uh, bosonic stars. So uh, if I can switch the slide, okay. So a very fast introduction to what gravitational waves are. Gravitational waves are these ripples in the fabric of space-time. They are sourced by accelerated masses uh, in a non-very symmetric way. Uh, there are many possible sources of gravitational waves. Anything can produce gravitational waves. I can produce them just moving my, my fist around. The problem is that space-time is so stiff that it gets something really, really powerful and catastrophic to produce gravitational waves that uh, we can have a chance to, to observe. So the best candidate uh, as of now for our gravitational wave detectors are uh, the collision of, of compact objects, either uh, black holes or, or neutron stars. And these are the ones that Advanced LIGO has been detected since uh, 2015 with a detection of the DW event uh, 150914, which was the, the first detection of gravitational waves. So having named this first event, uh, I want to, to give a, a brief overview of how these signals, these signals look like and what actually they represent. So what, what we can infer directly from the shape of, of these signals. So um, on the left, you see the uh, typical gravitational wave strain of, uh, of a typical LIGO event, in this case, GW50914. And you can see, let's say, uh, three portions in the signal. The first one is a, a portion in which the uh, frequency of the signal increases slowly, the amplitude increases slowly. These are the two black holes uh, in spiraling into each other. Uh, and the orbit is progressively accelerating and getting closer and closer. Um, at the maximum of amplitude or, or around that region, the two black holes are merging. They are forming a distorted black hole. And this black hole is going to settle to a final black hole emitting what's known as the ring down radiation, which is this uh, signal of uh, with an exponentially decaying shape and an approximately constant frequency. So that's what you see on the left. That's the, the time domain time series. Uh, but there is a, an alternative description that is very, very useful. Uh, that is the one I put on the right, which is, uh, 
plotting which I show the time in the x-axis and the frequency of the signal on the y-axis and the color code denotes the, the power in each of those time and frequency bins. So what you can infer again is that you see a, a, a track of a frequency that is progressively increasing and the power is also increasing until the point that it gets to a maxima around the frequency of, of, of the merger. So around the frequency at which the two black holes collide. So this is how a typical uh, gravitational wave uh, that LIGO and Virgo have observed so far uh, looks like. It may be longer, it may be shorter. Uh, the, the power in the signal may not outstand too much from the noise, but, but this is, these are the common properties. And once we see this morphology, we, we are in a very good position to assume that the source of this is a um, collision of two black holes in a quasi-circular orbit. And in the following, I'm gonna omit the, the, the word quasi and I'm gonna just say circular. I think that that's going to take like three minutes uh, away from, from my talk. Um, so uh, this is a summary of all of the gravitational waves that were observed in the first Atlas LIGO run. As of now, we have of the order of 50 observations after three runs. But uh, for the purpose of just showing that all of the signals basically have the same shape in which we see the in spiral, the merger, uh, and the ring down portions. In particular, the, the, the spiral track that, that increase in frequency as a function of time is, is quite visible uh, in all of the events. And the, therefore, we are in a very good position to, to assume that these are mergers of, of circular uh, orbits. In fact, uh, I don't know if Isabel is in the call, but she looked for uh, traces of uh, alternative dynamics. So uh, mergers that are not uh, circular that have some eccentricity. And all of these events were, were consistent, as far as I remember, uh, with zero eccentricity. So we can assume safely that these are um, mergers in circular orbits. Um, a very important property that's going to determine whether you can uh, be confident about whether this is a, a, a circular merger of two black holes or maybe something else is the mass of, of, the, of the source. And this is because the frequency of the signal goes with the inverse of the mass. So the heavier the object, the lower the frequency. So for instance, uh, here in this plot, you can see the Fourier transforms of the of three of the gravitational wave events or three of the signals consistent uh, with these events. Uh, the first one is the first detection, 15914. And you can see, first of all, that the signal stands out a lot from the noise. This was a very loud detection. Uh, but um, the, the, the main point I want to make here is that the ring down frequency, so the, the, the maximum frequency at which the signal has a reasonable power, um, is, is very, um, is, is to the right. So the, the signal is, is quite high. Uh, and and you, you may ask, okay, it's to the right, but with respect to what? So uh, in black here, you have what, what we call the power spectral density of the detector, which describes basically the noise of the detector. And you can see that it rises dramatically at low frequencies because of the uh, seismic noise of the Earth. So if we are in a situation, if we increase the mass a lot and the frequency of the signal is reduced too much, this signal is going to start to disappear behind the seismic wall of the, of the detector. So you see less and less and less in spiral cycles in case those are there. So as an example, here we, uh, we show a progression or I show a progression. This is the first event. The second I uh, show is uh, 170729, which is a way heavier event than the first one. And you see that the frequencies have shifted towards lower values. Still, for this event, we were able to say this is a circular uh, merger. And uh, on green, this is uh, GW190521, which is the event I'm going to discuss. And you can see that the, 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 the peak frequency is way closer to what we call the, the seismic wall of the detector. And therefore, it's not going to be so clear that, first of all, there is an in-spiral at all. And second of all, that in case there is, that in-spiral actually was. So that, that merger was a circular one. Um, so let's recap what the status of GW detections was before GW19521. Um, what I show here, or what the LIGO collaboration usually shows in this plot, are all the compact objects we know of um, in this mass range from uh, one solar mass to 10 to the 5 approximately. So first of all, there are all of the neutron stars we know of from electromagnetic observations. 
we have in purple black holes that we know from electromagnetic observations and then in blue we have merging black holes that have produced uh, remnant black holes that are shown in green. Uh, so first of all, um, you can see that I'm highlighting here uh, four ranges or three ranges and, and one gap in the middle. Um, so the first range, the lower range that goes up to approximately 65 solar masses, is a range of masses in which we know that black holes or we expect that black holes can form from the direct collapse of a, of a star that uh, basically runs out of, of fuel and collapses under its own gravity. Uh, above 100 solar masses and up to 10 to the 5, it, there is the, the domain of what we call intermediate mass black holes. And um, this is a domain in which uh, up to this gravitational wave event, we had no observations. And observations here, uh, let's say, were needed or, or, or were much uh, sought for because we know there are supermassive black holes being hosted in the center of, of most galaxies and how one evolves from a population that we know of stellar mass black holes to a supermassive mass black holes is not clear. Uh, one hypothesis is, is the, the, the hierarchical merger. So um, several mergers of black holes that merge and merge and merge until they form a supermassive black hole. But without the observation of, any, of anything in the intermediate mass range, uh, it was kind of difficult to, to accept that as a, as, a, as a mechanism for which we have any observational evidence. Then this gap here between approximately 65 and 130 solar masses is what we call the pair instability supernova gap. Uh, and this is a, a very important uh, region because we do not expect black holes to be able to form here from the direct collapse of, collapse of a star. Okay, so an observation of a black hole in this range would either suggest that either we are not, uh, we should not believe too much what we think we know about stellar evolution, or that that black hole is just not the result of a uh, collapse of a star, but uh, the result of a previous merger. So with that said, let's get uh, to GW19521 and their uh, vanilla interpretation as a circular merger. So first of all, these three plots show the strain data of the LIGO Hanford, LIGO Livingston and Virgo detectors in light blue. And then on purple, orange and black, you have different reconstructions of, of this signal. In particular, I want you or you may want to pay attention to the black one which is um, the point-like estimate um, that you obtain when you just look for coherent power among the three detectors. And the orange contours are, the, are defined or are, are composed by the models for circular mergers that we, we think are more likely. Okay. And you can see that more or less they coincide except for maybe at the beginning of the signal, which is where a lot of information of this signal comes from. Okay, um, note um, before anything that unlike in the previous signals I showed, you don't see in this signal uh, evidence for an in-spiral track, right? You, you, you just see a, a signal that suddenly grows up and then decays. So uh, you, you could perfectly imagine that you may not be seeing two objects in spiral in here, but just a black hole that suddenly was uh, perturbed and it started to ring down and settle down to, to its final form. So in any, in any case, when we detect something, we assume it's a, circular, uh, it's, a, it's a circular merger of black holes and we proceed to estimate parameters, uh, assuming that. Um, just to show you how the time frequency map uh, look like, Again, I'm showing on the top the ones for our first detection, 15 or 9, 14, where you can see this clear in spiral track or what we call a chirp. So this uh, continuously increasing frequency, that's uh, far from clear for 19 of 21 both in Hanford and Livingstone. You, you, you can say that maybe there is something whose frequency is growing a bit, but it, it's far from looking uh, like 15 or 9, 14 or like any typical LIGO event. And well, uh, in Virgo, as usual, you, you don't see much. Um, so I've uh, kept the outline of, of the talk um, for, for this moment, just to, to tell you what I'm going to say about this event. Um, 
So first of all, I'm going to focus on the vanilla LIGO Virgo interpretation as a circular merger of black holes. Uh, the main consequences, I'm going to tell them right now, is that the remnant of this collision is an intermediate mass black hole or an IMBH, as we call them. The primary black hole is precisely sitting in that gap that I highlighted before that we call the pair instability supernova gap or PISN gap. So this event is going to be not problematic, but, but fancy. And uh, the spins we infer are very, very, or, or are very, very high, or tend to be very, very high. Although they are also um, slightly consistent with zero. <clears throat> However, given that we barely see any spiral power, other possibilities open up. Um, the first one, of course, is could this be an eccentric merger? And what are the consequences of assuming this is an eccentric merger? Uh, and in particular, I'm going to discuss two pieces of work, one by Isabel Romero Shaw, of course, from, from Monash, and by uh, Gayatri et al. from the Florida and Rochester groups. Uh, then I'm going to discuss uh, the possibility that this kind of signal uh, could correspond to a head-on merger of black holes. And then also, I'm going to put into question whether these are actually black holes. Uh, could this be uh, consistent with some kind of alternative source? Um, so how do we infer the source properties assuming a circular black hole, uh, a circular black hole merger or, or BBH? So the basic procedure is that we compare the data to, to waveform templates for this kind of collisions. Uh, we did it in a quite thorough way within the LIGO collaboration. We, we used three different models for this kind of collisions. And uh, also we compared the um, data directly with numerical simulations, which are in a way, the most accurate signal models that we can get. Um, all of these are um, state-of-the-art models. All of these include the effect of orbital precession, which is something that was not uh, used uh, for the first detection, for instance, initially. <clears throat> and this also includes the effect of what we call high-order multiples or high-order gravitational wave emission modes, which I'll discuss briefly uh, later. Um, the usage of, of these higher modes was also not common uh, in the first detections. Um, and remarkably, and uh, so that we can sleep well, all the models lead to reasonably consistent uh, estimates. So if we jump directly to look at uh, what the masses of this collision were, assuming a circular merger, uh, you can see on the left the two-dimensional posterior distribution for mass one and mass two. The contours uh, denote our 90% confidence intervals, and the three colors correspond to our three different um, signal models. Every time I quote a number, it's going to correspond to this blue model we call uh, NR SOR, which stands for NR surrogate, because this is we use this one or we kind of prefer this one because this is a direct fit uh, to numerical simulations that include all the physics of the problem. Um, so uh, some conclusions that can be drawn from this plot is, first of all, this is the most massive binary uh, we've ever detected with a total mass of 150 solar masses. Uh, from here, you can already assume that this is going to be uh, the result of this is going to be an intermediate mass black hole. So something with, with a mass up of 100 solar masses. Despite the fact that we barely see any effect of the uh, pre-merger dynamics, we can infer reasonably well the mass ratio which we can constrain actually to be larger than 0.5 or, or lower than 2. So the masses tend to be quite equal. And actually, uh, I should stress that the most preferred value is, is, is equal mass ratio. Uh, the individual black holes are the most massive colliding, colliding black holes we've observed. Uh, one is sitting squarely in that uh, pair instability supernova gap with a mass of 85 plus 21 minus 14 solar masses. And the other one has important support within, with that, within that gap, but has much more chances of, of being out of it. So it's not so much problematic as the first one. Um, actually, the probability that uh, the first black hole is out of the pair instability supernova gap is extremely low. It's just 0.32%. So we can say this is in the gap, and this should be a second generation merger, unless uh, someone can explain how this can form from the collapse of a star. Um, so, black holes can have masses, but they also are characterized by, by their spins. And actually, when you have them in couples, the relative orientation of the two spins is very important because that determines uh, the dynamics of the spiral, and that has a very important imprint 
on the signal, as we actually will see uh, for this signal. So usually when we report spins, we use this um, kind of plot consisting in two disks with pixels uh, with a given darkness that is actually quite difficult to interpret. So I'm going to try to dedicate one minute to tell you how to interpret this plot because it took me a reasonable amount of time the, the first time I saw it. So you need to imagine, or the way I do it is imagine that the two black holes are sitting in the two centers of these two disks. And then you throw an arrow that is going to be its spin. The orientation of the arrow is the orientation of the spin with respect to the angular momentum, which corresponds to, sorry, to the orbital angular momentum, which corresponds to this vertical arrow. And the length of the arrow is the norm of the spin, which of course is bounded by one. So this, the border of this disk corresponds to a magnitude of one. And the center of the disk corresponds to zero. Uh, the orientation of the spins is very important because if both spins are aligned or anti-aligned with the orbital angular momentum, then you don't have precession. So all the motion happens in two dimensions. Whereas if you allow for random orientations, then in general, you have the spin orbit coupling and that leads to orbital precession, which impacts the signal and actually has strong consequences on the remnant, on, on the remnant black hole. So um, going directly for the result, which is actually the one I was showing, um, for the primary black hole, which we show on the left, and actually for the secondary as well, you can see two things here. First of all, uh, most of the dark pixels accumulate near the borders of the spins, which means we have quite strong support for those extremal spins. So there's a lot of strong at spin uh, equals one, which is the, the care limit. But there is also decent support at um, spin equals zero. So with that information, we can actually compute the probability that this um, binary is actually spinning or not spinning. And we obtain, in terms of probability, a probability of uh, 8.5 uh, to 1 for this being a spinning binary. Second thing that you can observe is that the dark pixels accumulate near the equator of, of these disks, which means that uh, highly misaligned spins are preferred. So that means that uh, precession, orbital precession, should be preferred. And in fact, when you compute the probability for precession versus non-precession, you get uh, approximately 12 to 1. So both of these probabilities are non-negligible for, for the two respective effects, but non-conclusive anyway. You wouldn't claim a, a, a gold-plated observation of uh, precessing and spinning binary. Um, another very important feature of this um, observation is the, the distance and inclination. And in order to that, uh, to discuss distance and inclination, I need to discuss uh, very fast what are uh, what we call higher harmonics of the gravitational wave emission. So gravitational waves in general are a superposition of several emission modes. And the collection of modes that you observe depends on where you are around the binary. So uh, roughly, this, wor this works in the following way. If you are face on, so if the binary is face on to you, or in other words, if you are on the top or on the bottom of the orbital plane, you will only see what we call the dominant mode, which is the one that goes as twice the orbital frequency. And the signal will be loud. As you move towards more equatorial positions, then you start to see the whole collection of emission modes. But this also, the, 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 the net signal also becomes weaker. So uh, on the one hand, these uh, gravitational wave modes allow you to know in which, in which orientation you are or, or where you are around the binary. Uh, but also you have this kind of degeneracy between either being uh, far away and face on or very close and edge on because how the intensity of the signal works. Um, so the result for that inclination plus distance is uh, summarized in this two-dimensional plot. This theta j m parameter is the inclination. So zero is face on, uh, pi is face off. So you're on the bottom of the binary and pi over two is edge on. And uh, the basic conclusion is that uh, face on-ish orientations are preferred. And the, a very large distance or a reasonably large distance of, of five gigaparsecs is, is obtained. Um, this, this, this distance estimate does not coincide with the first one we reported, I think, six hours after the detection of this event, because the original uh, estimate did not consider these higher harmonics. So you, you cannot resolve the distance uh, as well as if you include them. 
In other words, uh, the fact that we realize that there are no higher harmonics in the signal makes us know that the binary has to be phased on so we can put it way farther away. Uh, and consistent with that, when we evaluate the probability for higher modes versus no higher modes in the signal, we obtain a, a, a slight probability in favor of, of not having those modes in the, in the signal and therefore having the source uh, face on to us. So when two black holes collide, they, they form a final black hole. And uh, this is characterized by a mass and a spin. And uh, we can infer this in two ways. I'm going to discuss one here, which is uh, once we know the parameters of the binary, general relativity tell us automatically what the remnant should be. So what's the final mass? What's the final spin? And we get the estimates that you see in this plot. Uh, this final mass is on the source frame. So this is the, the true final mass, let's say. Um, and we obtain 142 plus minus 20 minus 16. Uh, the main feature here is that there is absolutely no support below 100 solar masses. And therefore, uh, we can say this is the first conclusive observation of a black hole uh, in, the, in the IMBH range. Um, consistently with the fact that we did not have much evidence or an overwhelming evidence for this binary to be spinning, so for the individual black holes to be spinning, the final spin we get is typical among non-spinning binaries. So everything seems to be working consistently. And this is how the stellar graveyard that I showed before uh, looks uh, with this new detection. So we have the, the, the heaviest couple of merging black holes to give the heaviest uh, black hole observed so far with gravitational waves. So, so far we've said that this looks like a processing IMBH merger. I haven't told you why but that will come uh, in a second. So the question here is how come that given that we basically do not see any dynamics from the spiral or any signal coming from the spiral, we actually can infer that not only that there was an in spiral, but th that this was processing. It's like too much information for, for such a short signal. So um, turns out that this kind of effect that makes you think that there is precession can be mixed by, by some other dynamics. Um, what makes one think um, in the previous signal that there is precession is that the power, so assuming you are seeing an, an in spiral, the power you see is very low relative to, to, the, to the peak power for what you expect for a non-processing uh, binary. Uh, and I will show that in a second. But that kind of effect can actually be mimicked by a head-on collision of, of black holes. If you go back and look at this signal, you may think, as I said a few slides ago, okay, maybe there is no in spiral at all here, and I have just two black holes smashing into each other, in which case you don't see any signal until the two horizons basically touch each other. And actually, when you simulate that kind of system, you see this kind of signal, which resembles very much uh, what I showed before for, for the true uh, 1905-21 signal. So um, actually, uh, you can just... Uh, simulate some uh, signals from head-on mergers, compare them to signals from processing and non-processing circular, circular binaries, and, and see whether they look like each other or not. So we did that. And we did that for uh, different uh, total masses of the colliding black holes. Uh, remember that the total mass determines how much of the signal you see. So uh, let's start from the right uh, to the left. Usually I do left to right, but let's do the other thing today. Um, so when the black holes are very, very heavy, basically the only thing you're going to see in the signal is the final black hole ringing down. So here you have the in red, the Fourier transform of the signal from our head-on collision. And in blue and green, I'm showing the best fitting signals uh, from processing mergers and from non-processing mergers. So basically the conclusion here is that as far as those mergers lead to the same final black hole, you cannot distinguish the, the three signals or the three kinds of sources. And you can see that both in the, in the Fourier domain on the top and on the time domain on the left. And the, the, the aligned spin or the non-processing case, uh, it has a little difference with respect to the other two, but that's not detectable. On the other hand, if you go to the left um, and your uh, source is, is quite low mass, then you do not only see the, the, the merger, so the, the, the ringing down black hole, 
that you you have evidence actually that there was no wind spiral. So if you look at the red uh, curve here, which corresponds to this head-on merger, you don't see any power or barely any power at low frequencies. And then when you get to the merger frequency, so to, or to actually to the ring down frequency of the final object, then you see some signal. <clears throat> and when you compare this signal to that coming from uh, mergers in which there is an, an in spiral, either processing in the blue case and non-processing in the green one, you notice, notice that there is a huge difference here at low frequencies because there is a whole uh, in spiral dynamics that uh, your noise is not hiding. So it's very clear that the, the red signal that you have does not correspond to any of these two cases. Now, if you go to intermediate masses in which you, you may see some power or some evidence that there is actually a, a lack of power in the red case, but, but not the whole thing. And you try to fit this with processing signals and with signals from non-processing objects. You can see how precession can actually imitate this lack of power. And then, it, then there is some tiny difference, but this uh, is already too low intensity. But uh, the non-processing cases cannot um, imitate the shape of the signal. So this is why I said before that the, the evidence for precession in this kind of case comes from the lack of power at these uh, pre-merger stages. And you can see that also in the time domain where the red and the blue curve are very distinguishable, but the green curve shows uh, significant, uh, much more power than the other two cases. So conclusion, for some intermediate mass range that actually corresponds to that of, of 1905-21, one, one may actually confuse a processing circular binary with a, with a head-on binary. And there, is, and there are going to be consequences for the parameters you estimate. First of all, because head-on collisions are much, much more weaker than the, than the circular ones. So as a consequence, if you indeed have in your data the collision or a signal from a head-on collision, and you assume that you have a circular uh, binary, then you are going to overestimate the distance by a lot. And by a lot is by a factor of, of from three to 10, basically. Um, since you are going to overestimate the distance, you're also going to overestimate the redshift. What's going to cause a uh, underestimation of the uh, total mass in the source frame. And that's, uh, that corresponds to this top right plot in which you see there is a consistent underestimation of the uh, total mass. Um, the uh, third effect I want you to look at is the one I discussed. Uh, this chi p parameter describes the level of precession. So zero is no precession, one is maximal precession. And you can see that in this intermediate mass range, let's say from 200 to, to 300, um, this parameter prefers processing binaries consistently with the plot I, I was showing before. And then, well, the, the values we infer for, for what we call the, the effective spin <clears throat> and the mass ratio, basically what, what they are doing is to try to make, to make the signal as short as possible to be able to mimic uh, our head-on collision. So conclusion, if you assume the wrong scenario, there are going to be huge consequences for the parameters you, you infer. And this actually has consequences for astrophysics because uh, because of this bias of the mass and the mass ratio that we get, um, you can be in a situation in, in, you can be actually in both these situations. One in which you have a black hole, so a, a black hole merger of black holes outside this very instability supernova gap. And your circular model tells you that one of these black holes is in the gap with high confidence and vice versa. You may have a merger of black holes in this uh, per instability gap and your wrong analysis will tell you that these black holes are actually out of the gap. So, um, Mind the gap. Um, so um, let's go to real data. Let's go to analysis that have been done actually on the uh, 21G data. Let me check how much time I have. 25 minutes, I think. Um, okay. So the first piece of work uh, actually was led by led by uh, Isabel, and Isabel investigated the possibility that the source was not processing, but actually had some mild level of precession. And uh, the main result uh, she got is that uh, if you assume such a thing, then um, you find that the source, first of all, has to be processing. Sorry, it has to be eccentric if you forget about precession. And uh, the, the model she considered only allows for mild precession. And uh, the level of precession that she inferred actually saturated the, 
the capabilities of the model. So that's evidence that if you neglect precession, then you need eccentricity. Um, that has um, a couple of, of um, consequences, which is a uh, tiny estimate, tiny change in the estimate of the masses. Nevertheless, the primary mass is still within the very instability supernova gap. <clears throat> and even if you measure a parameter, you need to perform model selection in the, in the Bayesian sense. And you need to determine your level of preference for either the processing model or the eccentric model. And the, the level of preference um, uh, is Does not include um, uh, higher emission modes. Of course, of course, it doesn't include precession, but that I, I had said already. So, keeping with this story, uh, some other people tried. Uh, let's go for very high uh, levels of eccentricity. So, the people in Florida and Rochester compared this signal to a rather very sparse set of signals, <coughs> of simulated signals for uh, binaries that could be either precessing, eccentric, or both. And they find that they find out that the, their best fit happens for for this point in the parameter space, which corresponds to very high eccentricity, 0.7, and uh, uh, actually uh, uh, a decent level of precession. Um, sorry, the eccentricity is 0.67, the precession is 0.7. So it's a very quite highly eccentric and quite highly precessing source. This is their best fit point. Um, so that's fine. They, they, they can estimate the best fitting point, but they are not actually performing uh, model selection in the in the formal sense. So it's difficult to determine whether this, this full model they are comparing with would be preferred with respect to that of the LIGO and Virgo collaborations. Nevertheless, even if you assume this model, um, you end up not only with one, but with two black holes in the pairing stability supernova gap. So the source is twice as problematic. Now, one advantage is that, as I said, eccentricity makes the source weaker. So then you reduce the luminosity distance and you make it quite consistent with that of a, uh, an electromagnetic counterpart uh, that was found at a time and location uh, roughly consistent, but not too much with, the, with those of the gravitational wave event. Actually, there are some studies saying that <clears throat> this putative electromagnetic counterpart in the gravitational wave detection location are not uh, really consistent. So, uh, keeping with this escalation in levels of eccentricity, let's go for head-on black holes. So what we did was to compare the uh, 1905-21 signal with a set of simulations for head-on mergers of black holes. These are state-of-the-art in the sense that they include all the dominant, um, all the dominant gravitational wave emission modes. And um, as it happens, sort of uh, with the study uh, that I showed just uh, before, uh, we cannot claim uh, we have a proper prior on, on the possible parameters because what we tried was to, let's see, first of all, if we can get a good fit to the data. <clears throat> the answer is that our fit is not going to be as good as that of the LIGO collaboration, uh, and hence we are not going to uh, push too much for this kind of model. Anyway, let's see what parameters will be inferred. Um, some interesting things happen. Uh, that are consistent with the ones I, I showed before. Uh, the total mass uh, that we get uh, is uh, lower. Sorry. The total mass that we get uh, redshifted is lower than that for the binary black hole model. And the reason is that the luminosity is lower. So you radiate less mass to reach the same final black hole. Uh, therefore, we get a lower distance. And uh, the, uh, the source frame mass we infer is actually larger because the distance is lower. Okay, so the, the redshift estimation is, is way lower. Um, however, as I pointed out, uh, the signal to noise ratio or the, the fit we get to the data is worse than that the, of the LVC or the LIGO Virgo collaborations. Uh, and therefore, we, our model selection is going to discard uh, this kind of model. But let's let, let's see why the data doesn't fit. So wh why the data doesn't fit this kind of templates? <clears throat> uh, we find two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, the final spin 
of the, the, the LIGO collaboration in first with these uh, circular models is a 4.7. This is pretty high. And it's actually very high if you consider a head-on collision in which there is no orbital angular momentum that can contribute to that final spin. Uh, and you can see that in this plot uh, where basically I show in black the contour for the final mass, in this case, redshift and the final spin that the LIGO collaboration obtained. And in pink, I show our samples for the head-on collision merger. And there, there is a hard cut in here, which none of our mergers could surpass. So there is this hard cut in, in 0.7. Um, we have the limitation of the lack of orbital angular momentum, but of course, uh, on top of that, the two black holes have their spins bounded by one. That's the curl limit. Um, so you have a limit on, on the final spin, uh, no matter what. Um, getting a large final spin could be achieved with very high mass ratios in which the final spin is dominated by that of the big black hole, but those prove to be uh, inconsistent with 15, 19 21 in the sense that as, as we increase the mass ratio, the fit was going down. And our model selection discards this model with a log base factor of five, which is like high confidence. <clears throat> and the second reason why these uh, signals do not fit is that there is actually no pre-merger emission. Uh, so when we compare our best fitting template with the uh, best fitting Okay, in this case, I made a spoiler. Okay, with, with, the, with some other best fitting signal to the data, you can see that there is a huge difference here at the beginning of the signal. So the, the green model, which is the black hole, lacks power, has no power before peak, whereas other models that fit better, including that of the LIGO collaboration, actually have power here that can um, give some extra fit to the data. So uh, let's take a different approach. As I said, um, the main limitation or the one of the fundamental limitations we found is that we cannot get the final spin of that final black hole using a Helmand merger of black holes. Um, and this is partially caused because of the fact that uh, these two black holes have the spins bounded by one. So there is a limit in how much uh, final spin you can have. So what, are, what if you go for objects that are not subject to, to this limit of one in the spin and can just go above it? Then you can form a highly spinning remnant. So a um, uh, handy option we had for this, uh, because uh, the people in, in Portugal and Valencia uh, actually simulate the objects I'm going to describe, are collisions of bosonic stars. Uh, bosonic stars and ultralight bosons can come in many, many flavors. Uh, but in this case, uh, we're going to touch to the following. So first of all, um, these uh, Proca stars that we are going to call like that are self-gravitating Bose-Einstein condensates. And this condensate is formed by what we call ultralight bosons. Uh, as I said, these ultralight bosons can come in many, many flavors, scalar, vector, tensor, um, real fields, complex fields. Um, in this case, we're going to touch to uh, complex ultralight bosons and vectorial, so spin uh, equals one. These are solutions of the uh, Einstein, of the, so the star is a solution of the Einstein equations coupled to the Proca equations, which is basically the Klein-Gordon equation um, for a particle with spin one, massive particle. And uh, these ultralight bosons have been uh, proposed as uh, dark matter candidates are, and are um, kind of uh, one of the easiest extensions of the, of the standard model of particle physics. The stars that these um, bosons can form have, of course, no event horizon. They are no black holes, but their collisions can produce a black hole. Uh, as I said, the spin of these stars is not bounded by, by one. So this final black hole can actually have a large spin. And um, we are going to touch to the case of uh, vector bosons and not scalar, because as I discussed, if we are considering a Helon merger, we need something that it's spinning uh, and merging. And it turns out that uh, boson stars form of scalar bosons are actually unstable uh, if they are spinning. So we will attach to Helon mergers of uh, um, of um, Proca stars, which are uh, ultra, which are um, condensates of these uh, ultralight bosons in the vector case. Okay, so these stars are going to have all of the parameters uh, that the black holes have: spins, masses, etc. But there are two extra parameters that describe new physics. 
Uh, the first of them is the uh, oscillation frequency of the bosonic field, and this determines the, the, the compactness of the star, so in a way how much it can mimic uh, the compactness of a black hole. And the other one is the mass of the boson, which determines the maximum mass that this star can have before uh, collapsing to a black hole and bringing down. Um, as I didn't say, but I'm going to say now, uh, there is a limitation in this uh, study, which is that we restrict to uh, collisions of stars of equal mass and equal spin. The reason is that at the moment we started this, we had two simulations for these kind of objects, and we got up to 40, but uh, that was it. So we, we said, let, let's be consistent, let's uh, take it easy and attach to the, to the equal mass case. Um, these simulations are done with the Einstein toolkit that maybe some of you know. And again, they include all the all the dominant modes. In particular, I didn't mention earlier the two two and the two zero, which are actually co-dominant in the in the Helon case. Um, so again, we compare 1921 with this set of simulations, uh, and we have a prior now. Uh, so the prior is the following: there is, as I mentioned, this parameter that characterizes the the bosonic field, which is the oscillation frequency. So we choose a flat prior in a given range of um, of, of this frequency that actually uh, contains the full support uh, given the data. Uh, I'll, I'll show the plot later and you see what I'm actually meaning. So let, let's jump directly to what parameters we infer. Uh, so as with black holes, we get a, a lower detector frame mass. So this is the mass measured in the detector frame uh, with the redshift folded in, in, in it. And again, the, the, the mass is lower because the source is weaker. So in order to reach the same final black hole, you need to write it less mass. <clears throat> because we have uh, now highly spinning stars, then we can now have high, high uh, final spins. And uh, you see that there is some extra bit now in this plot that was not the previous time I, I showed it. And these are the samples for the final mass and spin we get from the uh, Proca star mergers. And you can see that now uh, this coincide, uh, not 100%, but uh, fairly well with those predicted by the uh, circular black hole uh, BBH models. Actually, we could even tr dry, uh, draw some very lame 90% uh, credible interval, which is almost fully within the, that for the uh, merging black holes that, that the LDC used. Uh, a, a nice thing that I didn't comment before is that uh, despite not reaching high spins, the samples that we get for the Helon black hole mergers are actually consistent with the values for the final mass and spin that you infer from the very end of the signal. So solely from the ring down and not including the, the pre-merger physics and assuming that this was a, a uh, circular binary. So in, in that sense, all of it is, is very consistent. Also, uh, the darkness of the samples determines the, the likelihood, which basically means the goodness of the fit. And you can see that the darkest points actually correspond to, to these uh, Boston star mergers. Um, this is just showing explicitly that, uh, that the level of preference for these uh, simulations of Proca stars is much larger than those we got <coughs> for, for our head on black hole merger. So there, this was this hard cut in our base factor that determines our level of preference for the model. And the, the, the boson stars, or Proca stars as we call them, um, largely surpass this limit. Um, we infer a distance of around 500 megaparsecs, so 10 times closer than that of the LVC. Therefore, uh, consequences for, for the total mass. And we can also infer uh, the inclination of the system. And as I said before, uh, having more than one mode in the signal or in your signal model helps you to measure both the distance and the uh, inclination um, of, the, of the object, of the, of the source. And you can see that the uh, contours we get or the measurement we get uh, when we include this extra mode, so in particular the two zero in our models, uh, are more constrained than, than the gray ones, in, which is the case in which we neglect such mode. Uh, and actually, uh, you see a bigger panel here that, that uh, says in the x-axis phi, um, when you describe the orientation or your location around the source, there are actually two angles. One is inclination, of course, and the other one is where you are around that source. Uh, turns out that when you have more than one mode in the signal, you make the signal um, highly asymmetric, and therefore you can actually infer where you are around the source. 
<clears throat> and and um, in order to, to make this measurement, you need a preferred direction in the space with respect uh, to which you can measure uh, your angle, right? And the, in the Hellman collision case, there is an obvious axis that you can choose, which is the collision axis. So uh, we infer this measurement uh, for, for this angle. So basically between zero and uh, pi over two or between zero and 90 degrees. And basically this is telling us because of the symmetries of the system that the projection of the line of sight onto the collision plane, which I'm trying to show um, on this plot is restricted to either the first or the third quadrant, okay? So you have here the two colliding stars. This is the collision axis. This is the projection of the sphere or the sky around the source onto the collision plane, which is orthogonal to the, to the final spin. And the, and the location is restricted to the, uh, one of these two lobes. And the reason why you can actually measure this is because of frame dragging. Uh, the two stars are spinning, so the trajectories are slightly curved in the direction of the spins. And you can actually are, you actually are able to infer that uh, the closest black hole to you is actually approaching your location. This is, this is the measurement you're being able to do because of this frame dragging and assuming this very particular uh, collision scenario. Uh, as far as I know, it, it, this is the first time that, that such a measurement is demonst demonstrated even uh, with simulations. So I think it's, it's actually a quite nice detail. <clears throat> and finally, um, I see a comment here in the chat, three minutes. Okay, that, that's fine. Um, so just to convince you that the, this uh, bosonic model actually fits, uh, the, our best fitting models for this uh, bosonic merger model are uh, in red and actually in blue for an experimental case that we did uh, with an equal masses. And both of them actually are, are very similar or produce very similar results uh, with respect uh, with respect to the, the LVC model, which is the black one, okay. Um, I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna directly jump to, to model selection. I'm not gonna go through all the uh, introduction to Bayesian inference. I'm just gonna say that two figures of merit that we can look at uh, to understand what's going on is first of all, the best fit, which is measured by this uh, maximum likelihood. So this is the, the likelihood of the best fitting signal that a model um, can, can, can make up when we, compare the, when we compare it to the data. And you can see that both uh, our head-on models, our head-on uh, Procaston models, the, the one we base the study on, which is the equal mass in our exploratory and equal mass, produce best, uh, better fittings than the actual LIGO model. And that the uh, head-on black hole model uh, produces slightly low, lower fits. Um, you don't look at the uh, fit to determine what model you prefer, but you look sort of saying at the integral of that fit across all of your parameter space, um, weighted by the prior on, on each of those points in the parameter space. So you become, uh, you end up with your log base factor that determines your degree of preference for one or, or the other model. These log base factors are with respect to noise. So if you want to know the relative log base factor, you just subtract uh, two of these. So for instance, our head-on equal mass Procaster model um, is slightly preferred, uh, very mildly with respect to the LVC one. Uh, our unequal mass model is slightly more preferred. And this is despite of the fact that uh, BBH mergers, so the, the LVC model is gonna be preferred by default uh, by this kind of analysis, because it assumes that sources distribute uniformly um, in volume. Uh, so you're gonna prefer things that you can put at larger distances. When you remove that effect, from the analysis, the preference for the uh, Procaster model is actually increased uh, in, in a quite, uh, not dramatic, but decent way. So I'm just gonna end up by uh, uh, showing the new physics one can instruct from, from, this, from this kind of scenario. The first one is, as I said, the uh, oscillation frequency of the bosonic field. Uh, so we get an estimate of around 0.89, which as of now is just a number. Uh, the fact that this posterior or this distribution actually dies within the limits of our model means that we are actually covering the parameter space in a decent way. And from this distance, esti sorry, from this frequency estimate together with the mass estimate, we can estimate the, the mass of the ultralight boson that's responsible for this star. 
uh, that it's around uh, 8.7 times to the minus 13 electron volts. Um, there are lots of bounds on the mass of, of putative uh, ultralight bosons, but all of those are for real cases. So for real bosons, this one, uh, real scalar bosons. This one is complex and this one is uh, a vector boson. So those limits do not apply. So this is actually the, the first kind of, of estimate from any from any kind of astrophysical observation. Uh, and the last bit of information we can get uh, once we have the, the boson mass is the maximum mass that a boson star can have with this uh, with this ultralight boson um, building block before colliding into a black hole. So in other words, if it doesn't uh, sorry, if it doesn't uh, collapse to a black hole, it cannot ring down and therefore it cannot imitate uh, the signals we see in LIGO. So we set this maximum mass uh, around 173 solar masses, which automatically discards all the other events from LIGO as potential uh, boson stars with this boson mass. Uh, little warning, this is uh, under the assumption or, or restricting all of our model to head-on mergers. If we could simulate, which we cannot uh, as of now, circular mergers of boson stars, um, I believe that this distribution for the bosonic mass would increase, so it would be enlarged, and therefore it's not unlikely that this limit would go down a bit and maybe allow some of the other LIGO events to be candidates for boson star mergers. Um, this is just a, a exhaustive analysis on what uh, we call the, the Occam penalty for a given model. Uh, I'm not going to get into that and I'm just going to leave uh, the conclusions there. So 19 of F21 is a very, very interesting, in a, in, a, in a way, a very, very weird gravitational wave signal. It's consistent uh, with many explanations. Uh, the main ones that have been explored are the vanilla circular merger that has some problems or some um, fancy uh, properties like the PASN gap black hole. Eccentricity has been explored, that problem, which doesn't rule out the problem of uh, the PASN gap. And uh, what we have done is, let's assume this is not a, a collision of black holes and uh, fancy enough or, or cool enough to me, you're able to estimate the, the mass of a putative new particle. So I'm going to end up here. Sorry for the time I took. And um, yeah, please uh, go and ask questions and I'll try to answer. Thanks a lot, Juan, for this very clear and interesting talk and for presenting exciting alternative interpretations to this detection particularly the last one regarding a proper star uh, collision. Uh, so we have time for a, a few questions. You can um, either type it in the chat or raise your hand. I see Ilya has a question, please go ahead. Um, thank you, thanks very much for a nice talk, Juan. Um, so I had um, actually two questions. Um, one was um, uh, your comment that um, you may have a, a uh, issue with the uh, head-on collisions of binary black holes, um, uh, it being obviously don't have the angular momentum reservoir from the orbit, and so it's hard to get high spins. But could you not get relatively high spins uh, by uh, appealing to more extreme mass ratios? Uh, because obviously, if you have a, a very uh, rapidly spinning primary um, and it's high mass, then uh, the spin of the merger product should sort of track the spin of the primary. And the second question was, um, um, you mentioned that um, the LIGO analysis and some of the other analyses produce some um, relatively stringent limits on the uh, mass ratio, meaning that it's roughly comparable, or at least uh, I, if I recall correctly from the LIGO analysis, uh, um, fairly certain to be within a two to one mass ratio. And yet there have been arguments both from within LIGO, such as by my Fishberg, Daniel Holtz and others, and also outside by uh, um, Alex Nitz, uh, Colin Capano, um, um, who argued for more extreme mass ratios uh, in the later case, perhaps uh, uh, an intermediate uh, mass ratio um, solution, which really doesn't match well in my mind with um, the lack of a strong pre-merger signal. So I'm wondering if you could comment on um, how that uh, um, alternative solution is possible and how that fits in with, with uh, your analysis. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ilya, for, for the questions. So uh, responding to the one on the head-on collisions, I, I actually mentioned, I was talking very fast, that uh, you can get those very high spins via very high mass ratios, precisely, precisely because of the reason you said, you may have a very rap rapidly spinning big black hole, and therefore 
that's basically your final spin. Uh, the thing is that we found that as, as we raised the mass ratio more and more and more, we were rising the final spin, but the fit was going down. Um, and the collision also becomes more and more weaker. So it becomes more um, not preferred by our distance priors. So all of that made us conclude that, okay, let's not keep going up with the mass ratio and let's stop at, we stop at four. Um, regarding those options for uh, the circular merger scenario that you mentioned. So the work by Maya Fischbach, what they did was not to compare again the data with templates. They, they basically reweighted the, the, the results we have and they said, okay, let's assume that the primary black hole is above the gap. And then let's see, first of all, what, what would be the mass of the second? Um, and second, uh, how this hypothesis compares with, with the standard one. So of course, I mean, if you impose any priors you want, uh, you, you can get, you will get some result. Uh, but then you need to compute a, a, a base factor or compute your level of preference for your, your new model, which in this case is the one that says <clears throat> the, the, the primary black hole, the big black hole is above the gap. I don't know if they included this number in the paper, but I, I asked them privately and the result was a preference of 50 to one, if I remember correctly, for the for the LIGO scenario, which is obvious. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's just based on the fact that it's basically no support for that with, within uh, our analysis. Um, regarding the, the paper by Alex Nitz and Colin Capano, they actually recompared the data uh, with, with a phenomenological model. So I have my reservations about that, that particular waveform model. Um, first of all, because it's not, as far as I remember, directly fitted to processing signals and they find high mass ratio, high precession. Uh, so that's one of, that, that's the main caveat I have in mind right now. The second one is that I may be wrong, but I don't remember any uh, base factor again for let's say the LIGO version versus their high mass ratio version. Um, and my gut tells me that even if the fit to the data is equally good, the high mass ratio model should be uh, not preferred because again, the signals are much, much weaker. So you need them much, much closer and, uh, and your prior on distance is gonna, is gonna punish uh, that kind of model, which is somewhat what happens to our head on mergers but we actually have such a good fit that that that, that fit overcomes the, the impact of, of that lack of, of signal loudness. I don't know if I clarified or if I answered uh, completely. Thank you. I'm, I'm not I'm not at all convinced by the base factor arguments because I think that, uh, you know, um, to put it, first of all, um, they are very sensitive to the choices of uh, priors and secondly, they are and prior ranges and second and secondly, they can be uh, completely overcome by uh, uh, let's say your a priori uh, um, uh, preference for one model versus the other. So your your prior um, mm -hmm. yeah. um, odds ratio, right? So for example, if I am uh, reasonably convinced uh, that um, uh, you know th that I believe this, the models of uh, Alex uh, Hager and others that that uh, parent stability supernova really do happen, um, then uh, um, and let's say I ignore the uh, uh, hierarchical merger scenarios, then I would say, well, there are there aren't simply aren't any masses there. So I have 100% uh, confidence that, that uh, in any model that that uh, um, does not require me to put in a, a black hole in the mass gap, right. So, so I, I wouldn't necessarily, um, I don't necessarily buy the base factor arguments, but I, uh, but the argument about the lack of calibration um, to uh, um, uh, numerical relativity waveforms in the intermediate mass ratio regime is, is certainly a very strong one. Thank you. Yeah, just to just to end the comment. Uh, of course, uh, you have the ingredient of, of in your odds ratio of what's your level of preference for one model or the other. Uh, I, I was putting that to one in, in my in my way of thinking. So even if even if, if you put those to one and you don't prefer one or the other by default, uh, you're going to assume quite usually that your sources are going to distribute uniformly in volume, and, and this is going to punish the high mass ratio model. Anyway, I don't know what the actual num numerical effect would be. Thanks, Juan. Um, so we actually ran out of time for the, um, the time slot allocated for the seminar, but I'm happy to let the Zoom room open for a, a few more minutes. Uh, if you have more questions or if you'd like to chat with, Han, with Juan uh, for a few more minutes. Um, so before that, let's all thank Juan again.